the bootstrap. So the plan is we can bootstrap today. We'll see if we can finish it today or Monday. Wednesday is a review class. There's a practice test posted, and the solutions from which seven will go up today or tomorrow. And then the test is Friday. Remember, the test is only on hypothesis testing and confidence tests. All right, so I want to talk about bootstrap today. So imagine we compute some estimator. We'll just say that the estimator right now is just some function of the data. Maybe it's a plug-in estimator as we talked about. Maybe it's something else. But uh, just think of it as a function of the data. Remember, there's this thing called the empirical distribution, which is mass, puts mass 1 over n at each data point. We can think of that as a table where it puts mass 1 over n at this point, 1 over n at this point. So we're going to make a lot of use of this. And the first question we want to ask is, in general, how can I compute the variance of this statistic? It's really just a statistic. And this can come up you know, in many different places. In particular, think of a plug-in estimator. We did it even back in parametric statistics if you wanted to know what the variance of something was. And remember that the data are assumed to be established from some unknown distribution. So what are we interested in? We're interested in the variance Say in other words, the variance Let's call it theta hat 1, 
actually g. Okay, so that's a single draw. What have I just drawn? Theta hat itself has a distribution, right? A sampling distribution. By, by drawing x1 to xn from g and then computing g, I've actually just drawn once from the distribution of theta hat. Now I can repeat that. I can take a second sample. So this will be, I'm using the same symbols, but you should think of this as a completely separate, independent simulation. I simulate n observations from p. I compute theta hat. I'll call this one theta hat 2. Because this is a fresh sample. What have I got? I've just simulated from the distribution of theta hat. And I can keep doing that. So let's suppose I do this many, many times. And again, these, this x1 is not the same as this x1. I'm just using this to mean draw and observations. So these will be completely different numbers from here and so on. Now I take these numbers and I can choose this, let's say, capital B times. So just to have a concrete example, suppose we're dealing with the median. So all I'm saying is if I told you the true distribution, if you draw n observations, you compute the median. Then you could draw n observations again, you compute the median. You do that a thousand times, let's say. What you really have now is a thousand observations from the distribution of the median. And the sampling distribution of this. Of course, all of this is still pretending we knew P and we knew how to draw from it. We'll just keep going with that. And so, I can make these big as I want, because I'm the one doing the simulation. This is not like when I get data and you're just giving observations. I'm conducting this simulation. I can make it be 10,000, 100,000, whatever. What's going to happen to these variables, in particular, what happens to this when B gets large to this quantity? Yeah, by the law of large numbers, this converges in probability to its mean. And I'll just write an E sub P to emphasize the mean when the data are drawn from distribution P. I guess I called that gamma over there, right? And similarly, if I do this, this converges in distribution to Second moment. So, if I take the sample variance of these guys, if I, if I just look at this, let's call, let's call this beta bar. Sample variance of those singular values, well, I, I know I can rewrite that as this. And this is converging to this in probability, and this is converging to this in probability, so this converges in probability to precisely what I want the expected value of this minus. Expected value of theta hat squared minus the expected value squared, that's of course the definition of the variance. By the law of large numbers and by the continuous mapping theorem. So, if I knew the true distribution P, and if I knew how to, draw, how to simulate from it, I could always compute the variance of any statistic, an estimator, or any other statistic just by simulation. Simulate on observations, compute the statistic, repeat many times. The variance of these quantities by the law of large numbers converges to the variance that I want. And more importantly, because again I'm doing a simulation, I can make B as big as I want. So I can make this as close to this as I want. You know, the, 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 the difference between the true value and the estimated value is going to be very, very small. Now, there's the big question, which is that I can't really do this because I don't know P. The key step here was I had to be able to simulate P, but I don't know P. Okay. But here's what the trick is. 
trick is in the bootstrap. I don't know p, but I have an estimate of p. So why don't I simulate from my estimate of p? I'm just going to put in an estimate of p. The empirical That's the bootstrap. What am I doing? If I go back here for a moment, though, forget the simulation for a second. What am I really saying? I'm saying the variance that I want is just a functional. I don't know p, so I'm just inserting a plug-in estimator. Did I give this a name? All I'm going to do is I'm going to the bootstrap is really about not the simulation. Conceptually, it's that I'm going to estimate this variance, which is a functional of p, with its plug-in estimator. Putting in the empirical. In principle, I could compute this n-dimensional integral with p in place of pn. I don't even need to do simulation. I could just take this formula, replace p with pn, and try to do it. But it's an n-dimensional integral. Actually, it'll become a sum because it's discrete. It's an n-dimensional sum. It's going to be very, very complicated again. So instead of doing that, I can still resort to simulation. The same, the same uh, logic applies. To avoid doing the integral there, we did a simulation. Same here. To avoid that integral, I do a simulation. The only difference is, instead of simulating from PM, simulating from PM. But the simulation part is not the bootstrap, really. The simulation is just to avoid having to do a complicated integral or sum. The real part of the bootstrap is replacing the unknown distribution here the empirical distribution as an estimator. And that's called the bootstrap estimate of the variance, which we'll denote. Just to make it really clear, we could either call it variance with a big hat on it, or if you want to think of it this way, it's the variance of theta hat oops, computed under as if the truth was p sub n. Okay, now let's think about what it means though. What does this actually mean? So let's think about actually implementing this. I have to draw n observations from this distribution p, and we know this distribution. Then you compute your statistics, say the median, and now we repeat this whole process, say, 10,000 times. Now you're going to get 10,000 medians, and you're going to just take the variance of those. That's it. Very simple. However, how do you sample from an empirical distribution? Let's think back to what the empirical distribution is. The empirical distribution is the distribution, it's discrete, and it puts mass 1 over n at each observed data point. So let's think of drawing n observations from this distribution. And so what happens? Well, let's draw the first observation. How do I draw the first observation? Well, this distribution says I choose this with probability 1 over n, this with probability 1 over n. In other words, I just choose one of the data points with equal probability. That gives me the first draw. So we usually call that a bootstrap sample. When we're drawing from the empirical, we usually put stars on it. These are called bootstrap samples. Just to remind us that we're drawing not from P, but from P sub M. And so the first observation I get from drawing one of these data points is equal probability. Now I go to draw the second data point, same thing, drawing from the same distribution. These are IID draws from P sub M. So I just draw one of the data points with equal probability. And you do that until you have n observations. So what's going to end up happening is you're going to get the, all your sample values are going to be data points, but some of them will be repeats. Some of them you might miss completely, but it doesn't matter. That's still n independent draws from the empirical. Now, here comes the uh, crucial wording, which is some people say bootstrapping is resampling from the data with replacement. What they mean is this. Suppose I took the data points and I put them in a hat on the table. And I randomly draw, you know, I have a piece of paper for each data point. I randomly draw a piece of paper. That's my first sample. Now I put it back in the hat, mix it up and draw again. And I do that n times. So that's resampling from the data. But I'm drawing with replacement. Every time I draw a point, I put it back. But you can see that's just another way of saying I'm drawing every data point with equal probability. But that's just another way of saying I'm sampling by ID from the empirical distribution. So although it's usually described as resampling from the data, I actually think that's kind of confusing and misleading. 
What you're really doing is you're drawing n independent samples from the empirical distribution, which is just an estimate of p. We would like to draw from p. We don't know p. So instead, we draw from p sub n. And we're drawing n observations from p sub n each time we do this, which happens to be equivalent to resampling from the data n times with replacement. Isn't it the same to do that and, like, assuming that there is a uniform distribution of the data? That's what this is. The empirical is a uniform distribution over the data. But then why if the true distribution is actually not, not uniform? It's not. We know that Pn, though, this, we know that Pn is a good approximation, though, to P. Right? Well, at least in one dimension, we proved that the empirical is very close to the true distribution of high probability. So you shouldn't think of it as uniform. You should just think of this as an estimate of this. understand it as you have like for example you have original you have 2,000 data points and then you draw like 100 data points each time for your sample for that's right this numbers? this each bootstrap sample is exactly the same size as the original sample that's important because we're trying to get the distribution of theta hat when we've drawn 100 observations from the data right suppose you, you have the median and you have 100 data points. I want to know what's the variance of the median, median when I have 100 data points. That's the distribution we're interested in. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be drawn from the correct distribution. It's the distribution of this that we're really after, which is a function of n data points. So you better make sure n is the same as your data. So I know, uh, on the one hand, this is simple. It's just a simple algorithm. But it's also sort of subtle, so let's, I want to make sure that we get all the questions answered here. Is the algorithm clear? I mean, you think you can see that one of the appeals to this here is it's very easy to implement, of, right? That was a difference if you draw like a, a 10 times each time, 200 times you draw. It's a good question. So there are. So what I'm going to describe for you is that that question deserves a prize. <laughs> the previous teacher. <laughs> Ryan left me a candy, so I decided I was going to give out. A, I decided I'm going to give this out as a prize in class. He deserves a prize. <laughs> Cherry candy. Right. And if it's really bad, blame Ryan because I didn't. <laughs> what would happen if instead of choosing n, I chose two times n or something less than n? So the, what I'm showing you is what's called, you know, the, I'll call it the basic bootstrap, the standard bootstrap algorithm. There are many different flavors of the bootstrap algorithm. And indeed, there are times when you don't want the bootstrap sample size to be the same as the original sample size for certain technical reasons. Okay, but uh, that's for certain complicated situations where there's other biases. And so there's very, very many different uh, ways we can alter the bootstrap. But for now, we're just going to do the standard bootstrap, and we really do want the distribution of this with respect to n observations, so you really do want to make sure that the bootstrap sample size is the same as the data sample size. I'm not going to talk about the other variations. There are reasons for doing other ones, but we won't talk about that for now. Generally, you want it to be the same size. And I think you can see why this is appealing, because now you can write code to do this very easily, right? You just draw n observations with replacement from your data, if you want to think of it that way, or just think of it as, again, drawing n observations from the empirical. Then you compute this function, and this could be really complicated. And this could be compute the covariance matrix, find the first eigenvalue, do this, do that. It could be a, like a computer program. You know, it could be something quite complicated. But at the end, all that matters is that when I put in my distribution of stars, when I put this in here, out pops this number for whatever that is. And, and so coding this is very simple, even for pretty complicated statistics. Assuming you can write a program to compute G. Then you repeat it, let's say, 10,000 times. You get out your 10,000 numbers. You take the variance. That's it. Now you have an estimate of what you want, which is the variance of theta hat. Okay. So did I get this in a? Uh, I'll call this two things. Let's just call it S squared, for lack of a better name. Maybe S squared sub boot or something. Let's just call it S squared. Well, actually, I'm going to put the boot down here. Just remind us it is from the boot 
is the procedure clear? Now again, if we were very good at doing sums and integrals and stuff, we wouldn't even need to do the random sampling part. We would just take this integral and replace all the p's with p sub m, but again, it's, that's not generally feasible in practice. So there's really two approximations going on. Yeah, there's this step. So first of all, what do we want? We want this functional. We want the variance that happens, we can think of as just some statistical functional, something that depends on p. The first approximation is we're doing statistical estimation. We're replacing p with pn. But that just gets us to here. And again, doing that integral is going to be very difficult. So then we do this Monte Carlo sample. So that's the second approximation. I'm using the law of large numbers to say that's approximately equal to this s squared root. But let's think about the size of the approximation. This is like typically what happens. So this is to say what happens typically. We're, we do an estimation problem. We're estimating a parameter. And the size of this is typically like this. This is like saying, you know, if I ask you how close is x bar to mu, you know that's big O P1 over mu n. That's sort of what's going on here. I'm doing some sort of estimate. I'm being a bit loose here because this is actually could be sort of a bit complicated, but roughly speaking, it's typically going to be something like about 4 to 1 over root n. What's going on here is I'm taking the true variance and I'm replacing it with a simulation. But again, that, the only error here is really things like this. How close is this, sent, is this sample average to the theoretical average? Again, it's, it's you know, like the law of large numbers. And we, what do we know about that? That's going to be order 1 over the square root of b. Bootstraps. This we have no control over. You know, you get n data points. That's it. This is something we can control. We just keep doing the bootstrap longer. And so we usually take b to be pretty big, like ten thousand, say, and that makes this error very small. So when people analyze the bootstrap, they typically just ignore this error because this is the one that we worry about. This is the bigger error. This you can make as close to zero as you want. So the distinction between these two things, you'll notice I won't talk much about that distinction in what follows. Because again, by just simulating longer, we can make it as small as we want. This is the bigger error. The fact that we're replacing the distribution with the empirical is what causes most of the error. What we do know is that as n goes to infinity, though, this does, under certain conditions, get closer. So under certain regularity conditions, we know the following thing, that this s squared root over what we'd really like to estimate, which is the, vari the true variance of theta hat, goes in probability to 1 as n goes to infinity. The reason why I wrote that as a ratio rather than a difference is the standard error of an estimate goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. So if I took the difference, it's not really telling you much. If I tell you that the true variance is going to 0, the estimate's going to 0, what does it mean to compare two things that are going to 0? You know, when we're estimating a fixed parameter, like a mean, it's just a number. But when you're estimating a standard error, the standard error is itself going to zero. So looking at the difference isn't very informed. It's much more informed to say the ratio, because this is, this is going to go to zero as n goes to infinity typically, right? It's a variance of an estimator. So is this. But the ratio is going to one in probability as n goes to infinity, under some conditions. So this is a little bit complicated, so I'm not going to talk about it. But it's certainly much weaker conditions than what we did when we did parametric methods. This is a very non-parametric method. While there are conditions required for the consistency, they're much, much weaker than in parametric methods. This is a non-parametric method for estimating the variance. So just to get a feeling again for how useful this is, if I said now, pick the median. Pick the median of the day. You got the mean. Now I want you to get the standard. How do you make compute the variance of the median? It's not easy. In fact, even if I told you the uh, something with the data, it's not easy. In fact, one of the, there was a section I skipped a few lectures ago about robustness. If you look in there, I actually compute the asymptotic variance of the median. It's pretty complicated. The calculation is complicated, and the final formula itself is not useful because it's got unknown things in it. 
So you can confuse the variance of the median. It's a pretty complicated thing. And now you know how to do it. It's good bootstrap. If I said, what's the variance of the maximum likelihood estimator? You could do the Fisher information and all that stuff, which you may have to do on a test. But <laughs> in practice, you don't, you know, computing that Fisher information might be really hard. Now you know you can do the bootstrap. It's very easy. So that's the appeal here, is that it's very general, very simple, very easy to do, saves you a lot of work. It's really a great invention. Okay, so that's, that's the bootstrap estimate of the variance of an estimate. If we go back to our, if we go back to our plug-in estimates, remember I said in many cases you can estimate a functional just by computing functional of interest and applying it to the empirical, and I said, but somehow we have to get the standard error or the standard deviation, and now you know how to do it. We just take a bootstrap sample, recompute the estimator, and repeat many times. And then the variance of that will approximate the variance of the estimator. How close is going to be the bootstrap part with the true part without making any assumptions in the true distribution? Well, this is it. There's going to be two errors. Typically, under conditions, this is going to be about 1 over root n, and this one's going to be very much smaller, so it's mostly like this. So it's, you know, that's, part of, that's pretty much as good as it gets. Things don't need to converge any faster than 1 over the square root of n. Again, there are some conditions. You can make up some weird statistics where this is going to fail. I'll probably show you some of those later, but the conditions are pretty weak, pretty difficult. Certainly, again, much weaker than all those parametric assumptions. You can even combine parametric and non-parametric numbers now because you, if you sort of believe your model, you might define the estimator by the computing the maximum likelihood estimator. Now, to compute the variance of your estimator, you could do the whole Fisher information thing, but that's assuming the model is correct. But you could say, you know, I want to be a little bit cautious. I'll use the bootstrap here, which is a non-parametric method, to compute to approximate the variance of my maximum likelihood estimator. So you're kind of mixing things. You're using a non-parametric method to estimate the variance, but the parameter estimator was defined with a parametric assumption. And you'll see people doing that. You might sort of mix and match there. OK. Any other questions? Yeah. So if you wanted to use this to get a confidence interval for the state of distribution, you don't know how to use the observed distribution. We're so about to do confidence intervals. I'm glad you asked that. Actually, any other questions, though, before we move to confidence intervals? Does everybody feel confident they could program this now? Right. So how about confidence intervals? Can we use the bootstrap for confidence? That's a great question. See, if I had another candy. <laughs> <laughs> there are many different ways to construct a, a confidence interval using the bootstrap. The whole literature on this, but I'm just going to mention two. So method one is kind of easy. Well, they're both pretty easy. So let's suppose we did let's suppose we did an estimate of some statistical functional. Let's suppose we use the plug-in estimator. And as I mentioned, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, these plug-in estimators are asymptotically normal. So we could construct a walled style confidence interval where this is the standard error. But what was missing here is the standard error. So one answer to the question is use the bootstrap estimate of the standard error. That's just the square root of the variance. So, the, so one way to do a bootstrap confidence interval is just to do this. We'll put here S boot. Uh, so this would be one way to do it. Just use the bootstrap here. <laughs> However, there's actually a method that tends to be a bit more accurate, which is to directly try to construct a confidence interval without going through this wall formula. And here's how it works.
Here's what we're going to do. Let's define, let's call this, we don't have to call it F, but that's confusing. I think I'll call it G. Let's define G and T to be the probability probability, I've taken something very familiar, which is I have some sort of estimator. This is the true value. This is the square root of n. We often use quantities like that. They come up a lot. So let's think, can I somehow use the distribution of that quantity? Suppose I define g sub n to be the distribution of this quantity. Remember, this depends on x1 to xn. So this is really a function of n random variables, which is why I want to put the n here. And let me try to use this distribution, it's a distribution of this quantity, to construct a confidence interval. Now there's a problem. I have no idea what this distribution is because I don't know what theta is and I don't know what p is. Okay. But let's first do the following thing. I'm going to construct a confidence interval for theta, a different way than we've done before, which is to pretend for the moment that I knew this distribution. Or more correctly, suppose that I know this distribution gn. I'm going to construct a confidence interval. Now, then what I'm going to do is use the bootstrap to approximate that confidence. So how would I do this? Well, first of all, suppose again, for the moment, just pretend somebody told you this, C, this CDF, okay? So it's a CDF. It's an unknown CDF. It's not the CDF of the original data. It's the CDF of this quantity, some function of the data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at, because we're pretending we know g, I can pick a value here. This will be alpha over 2 and 1 minus alpha over 2. And I'm going to invert the CDF. So this will be called t, make sure it's up in the right order. Yeah, I think I call this one t, alpha over 2, t, 1 minus alpha over 2. So in other words, I'm calling t alpha to be, to be g and Because I'm pretending I know GN, therefore I know these two numbers. Well, I was just now saying in general, I'll call, uh, okay. giving sort of the general definition for the for any B. Okay. Now, let's look at the following. Confidence interval. I'm going to take theta hat, it's going to look a bit weird, minus t, 1 minus alpha over 2, that's the right guy, over the square root of n, and theta hat minus. Now, this confidence interval probably looks a bit strange. For one thing, most of the confidence intervals we've dealt with so far are theta hat plus something and theta hat minus something. These are both minus. And another thing is that here I have what looks like a lower quantile, here I have an upper quantile. I know this looks odd, but that's because the special form we had before was very particular to the normal distribution. Now we're not assuming that gn is normal, it's just some distribution. Let me show you that this actually, if we could compute this, that this would actually be an exact confidence interval. And the reason is just from definition. Let's just compute it, actually, so we can see that. So the probability that C traps theta, remember again, this is fixed and this is random, of course. Well, that's the probability that this the trap theta, this has to be less than theta, and theta has to be less than this, right? So we have to have that. Um, theta hat minus t, 1 minus alpha over 2 in the end. <coughs> Oops. <coughs> so now I'm just going to rearrange this. I'm going to subtract theta hat, multiply by root n, and multiply by minus 1 to get it so that root n theta hat So I'm going to get, this is going to flip. I'm going to get t alpha over 2 is less than root n theta hat minus 
theta, which is less than f of t, 1 minus i of 2. Rearrange it. But look, this thing is the random variable we're talking about. This is the thing here which has distribution gn. So the probability that a random variable is in between two numbers is just the CDF here minus the CDF here. Right? So it's gn t1 minus l minus gn t l But by definition, this is g inverse of 1 minus l over 2. So I have g times g inverse. So that's 1 minus l over 2 minus and again, this is g inverse of L over 2 times g, g, g inverse, and get L over 2 times 1 minus L. So the strange form is only because I'm allowing g to be arbitrary. If I stuck a normal here and use symmetry, you'd get an interval that looks very much more like what you're used to. But we're not forcing g to be symmetric. So that's great. If I told you g n, you would compute these two quantiles. This interval, you have an exact one minus alpha confidence interval. The big problem is we don't know gn, and hence we don't know these quantiles t. But there's kind of an obvious thing now to do, which is to simulate this with the bootstrap. So the bootstrap process now looks like this. I compute my bootstrap sample. And I get, let's call it, you know, beta hat one star, first one. And again, I get beta hat one star, and make sure it's the same as beta hat. We do that B times. So it's just like we did before. But now I'm interested in this thing. So what I do with all these samples is I estimate G directly. I estimate the CDF. I'm going to take to that, which is just going to be 1 over B times the indicator for how often. And now what I'm going to do here is replace this with the bootstrap samples and this with the original estimator. Just another empirical distribution, which you can compare. This is just the bootstrap approximation. And now I just take the quantiles from here, right? I just take, let's call it T alpha hat. So my confidence interval just replaces these with bootstrap. So what we started with is, let's construct an exact confidence interval as if we knew the distribution of root n theta hat minus theta. And now let's just take that confidence interval and replace the quantiles of that with a bootstrap estimate of the quantiles. So let me just stop and make sure the procedure is clear. <coughs> Pretty much the same as computing the variance, except instead of the last step being to compute the variance, we just compute this CDF. And then we compute this. And then under certain conditions, and we'll talk a little bit about this, it can be shown that the probability of this is right here. Let's see how I stayed here. Yeah. 
is, well, it's not 1 minus alpha exactly. It's an error of order 1 over root n. Where is that error coming from? Well, because we're not really using the true g. We're using some sort of statistical estimate. So it's only a, it's a large sample of observation. And just like a lot of the stuff, this converges to 1 minus alpha as n goes on. So if you did the wall test interval and this one, they'll be slightly different. They will not be the same. For large samples, they'll be almost identical. For, for moderate sized samples, they could be a little bit different. The general wisdom, I mean, so people have done sort of extensive simulation studies to say which one in practice is more accurate. And if I remember correctly, I don't want to make a definitive statement, but I, I, if I remember correctly, this one tends to be more accurate in small samples than the uh, wall one does. When you say in practice, you mean just making some artificial distributions and like doing extensive uh, experiments, or are using real data? This is data. So this is not an artificial thing. I'm I'm using the empirical distribution of the data. No, no, no. I mean, when oh. you do extensive. Oh, when they do simulation studies? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. People pick. You know, they just pick distributions, and then they simulate from it, and they they do it many times. They do this. They say, how often does it contain the true? You know, what was the true coverage? Was it really 95 or 94%? So people over the years have done various simulation studies. There should be more of that, frankly. I mean, people have done them, but I, I wish there was more, but there are lots of them out there. So, okay, so we're going to look at some examples, and I want to say why this works, what's really going on, this is kind of cool. But before I do that, so first of all, any other questions about this procedure? Everybody clear what we do? Yeah? In this case, when the true CDF isn't convertible, we would just change things to use like the theme of the range of the range. Yeah, in fact, it won't be invertible, right? So this is going to be a discrete distribution. So there could be more than one thing. It doesn't matter which one you pick. So if, in other words, if the 0.025 quantile isn't exactly well defined, you just pick one of the sample quantiles that's close to it. It's, it that's good enough. It doesn't affect the coverage. Okay, any other questions? Uh, yeah? The, the theta hat in the quantum sample there, uh, is that from a bootstrap sample? What's that? Is there a bird in here? Oh, somebody's <laughs> phone is making kind of noises. <laughs> Whose phone is that? No, I'll own up to it now. <laughs> it's whatever it is, that's a good brain. Uh, sorry. <laughs> 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 what was that? Oh, the estimator is arbitrary. So that could be a plug-in estimator. It could be some other estimator you thought of. It could be anything. Now, not quite anything, because there are regularity conditions here. But it's think of it as fairly general. It could be almost anything. Original data. The theta hat is before the bootstrap. You just have your data, you compute your estimator. Okay. You don't start the bootstrap until you want to get your standard error or your confidence error. Is that the same estimator that you use for the confidence uh, for the GN? For the GN? Yes, it is the one that's going in here. That's important. Whatever estimator you're choosing here, that is the one that is going in. Uh, the confidence interval or the estimation error has anything to do with B? I mean, just ignore. So there is another, so I left that out. I wrote this is of this order. There is an extra term, which is like order 1 over root B. But again, we can make B as big as we want. So this is the bigger term. So that's why we tend to just not talk about that, because that's a much smaller order. Okay, so what we're going to do next is I want to show you two cool examples of this works so to show you how easy it makes life. And then I want to show you the proof that this works is actually quite interesting. But first I want to make a few remarks. I'm going to jump to the end of the notes and make a few remarks because there's uh, only a few minutes left. So this is on page 9. 
Because, and I mentioned this last time, you can see how simple and general this is. I can take anything and apply the method of physics. But that's also dangerous. So here's some remarks. First of all, remember this is a non-parametric procedure, but it's an asymptotic uh, procedure too. So first of all, it's, it is non-parametric, but that doesn't mean there's zero assumptions. So that, roughly speaking, let's suppose our estimator, let's suppose our estimator is of the form T of P for some functional T. This T actually has to satisfy a certain condition. It's in the appendix. It's called uh, Hadamard differentiability. It's a little bit technical. I'm not going to go into it. But there is a condition there. Most of the things you use will be, will satisfy this condition. But there are exceptions. There are places where the truth that breaks down. Roughly speaking, what it means is, if I wiggle P around a little bit, T you know, has to change sort of smoothly when I change P. There has to be some sort of, uh, it's kind of like a smooth distribution of T. Again, most of the things you can think of will satisfy this. But it is possible to create counterexamples. And it's asymptotic. We're not saying it has exact coverage 95%. Some people have the misimpression. They'll say, I don't want to use asymptotic method. I'm going to use a bootstrap. The bootstrap is an asymptotic method. It only has 95% or one of coverage as n gets larger. Okay. There's something, an older method called the jackknife, which is very similar to cost validation. It's based on leaving one out. But the jackknife has been superseded by the bootstrap because the bootstrap actually works under much weaker conditions than the jackknife. Now, the biggest thing I want to point out is, as I said, there are conditions, and you'll see people using it all over the place. That's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you're careful about how you interpret it. As long as you just, some people just think of it as, I want some sort of heuristic measure of how variable my procedure is. And it's kind of interpreted as some sort of heuristic, you know, you can use it in almost any situation. But when you start making claims like this is actually a 95% confidence interval, there are conditions that are required. So I'll give you a good example of this. Um, for those of you who are in bioinformatics and uh, related areas, and even for those of you who aren't, you may have heard of phylogenetic trees, where you take genes or species and things, and you try to create a tree which orders, you know, this mutated into this, this mutated into this. It's quite a challenging task. Then at the end, people say, well, this was all a big estimate. How do I check to say how variable is this estimate of this phylogenetic tree? And so people will just run the bootstrap. They resample the data, recompute the tree, do this many times, and plot the trees. And I think as a uh, heuristic method, that's very reasonable. It gives you some idea, if nothing else, of how stable your estimation procedures. But there's an example where the conditions that we need don't hold. That's not a, you can't get a true 95% confidence set for a phylogenetic tree, as far as I know, using the bootstrap. So you just have to be careful in practice. Look at the literature a bit with, with whatever you're working on and see what's known about the, the bootstrap in, the, in your setting. Because again, there are some settings when it's formally justified and some settings when it's not, in which case at best it should be thought of as kind of an informal kind of diagnostic tool. We will do a proof on Monday of the validity of the bootstrap in a special case. And we'll see some of the conditions we need to, to make it work. So the plan then is, first, any, any questions before we wrap up? Yeah? Is there any way of uh, getting an estimate of the coefficient uh, appearing in that digital? Because yes. if there's none, that's like so flaky. That's a good question. Can I estimate how accurate the is? Yes, there are papers about how do I estimate you know, I'm saying this is a 95% coverage. Maybe I could estimate the coverage. Maybe I could find out it's really only a 92% coverage interval. So there are methods called, they're called bootstrap diagnostics for trying to estimate that. Sometimes they involve what's called double bootstrapping. If you need bootstrap, you do another bootstrap. And so it can get kind of computationally expensive if you want to see double checks. So the bootstrap, I can tell you, is a huge topic. There's so much literature on this because you can see how important this is. Um, so there's lots of interesting things about it. So what we'll do then is on Monday I'm going to do a few examples for you where, where I think it's show, to show you how useful this is. Then we're going to go through a proof of bootstrap and then we'll start something else. And then Wednesday is the practice or the uh, review and then the test. Any other questions? Yes, there's hang on. Can I know um, what's going to be in the exam? What kind of topic is going to be covered? I announced that at the beginning of the class. Sorry. Ah, you see? The price for coming late. <laughs>
price for not being on time. Uh, now you have to be a detective to figure it out. <laughs> All right. Have a good